finally got it, and I think that was my most happiest moment in my life when I got my contract to play in the Negro League. Life on the road was beautiful. Different cities, different places. I was young. And I knew I was playing with and against some of the best athletes in the world. They were great times. And they were very different times. Racial segregation was legal. In fact, in some parts of the country, it was the law. But over the decades, black baseball players who loved the sport with a passion showed so much greatness, they helped the walls of segregation come tumbling down. That pride and that passion is the story of the Negro Leagues. Thousands of freed slaves were introduced to baseball during the Civil War. But when one of the first Negro teams applied to join the National Association of Baseball Players, the application was rejected. Thus began a tradition that essentially barred black players from the major leagues for nearly 80 years. At first, only Negro teams were barred. So more than 60 black men did get to play on otherwise white teams before 1900. There were some stars among them, but they had to endure prejudice and abuse. Their own white teammates sometimes refused to sit with the Negro players for a team photo, and white fans often threatened violence. The color line was firmly drawn in 1887 when the International League barred new contracts with Negro men. As a result, all Negro teams began forming in the eastern and southern states. They barnstormed the country, taking on all challengers. By 1910, there were more than 60 professional black teams traveling the country. Until the 1920s, Negro baseball was a pretty haphazard affair. Players hopped from team to team when another owner offered them more money. Some teams simply folded on the road when they ran out of meal money. It was clear that to be successful, a league structure had to be formed, and it happened right here in Kansas City at a meeting in the Paseo YMCA. Andrew Rube Foster of Chicago was the mastermind. Known today as the father of black baseball, Foster assembled owners of the top Negro clubs in the Midwest. They hammered out a constitution and Foster became president of the National Association of Colored Professional Baseball Clubs, which operated the Negro National League. A second Negro League, the Eastern Colored League, formed in 1923. This fuel and intense rivalry akin to the major leagues. Negro League baseball became an important focal point in black life and a source of tremendous joy and pride. A Negro League game was the event of the week. Up to 10,000 people would turn out for a Sunday game. Pastors would even change the times of church services so folks could attend. Successful ball players were treated like celebrities. Being a ball player, you go to places that the other people couldn't go. Like sometime they might have a golf course. Blacks had never been there. We've gone there. Also be a ball player. The waitress would give you the best service. When you would go wherever you would go, you would go to the store to buy something, they're going to show you the best stuff and they would give you the discounts on the different things. And uh, everybody wanted to invite you to dinner. However, they also had to suffer the indignities of a segregated society as they traveled. Sometimes there was nowhere they could sleep or eat. In time, black businesses developed to meet the needs. Prejudice was an ugly, a mean thing. But during that era, is we owned a lot of things that we don't own anymore. See, the man owned the Streets Hotel was black. The man owned the restaurant, Streets Hotel was black. The man that had the, the, the bar there were black. Travel arrangements for the Negro teams became well established and they could avoid racial confrontations. Uh, we always stopped at black restaurants and, and uh, black hotels. Like if we went to New York, 
we would more or less stay in Harlem. If we went to Chicago, we'd stay somewhere on the south side. The economic depression of the 1930s brought hard times to black baseball. To help survive, the Negro League teams introduced night baseball in 1930, five years before they had it in the white major leagues. Another important development was the All-Star Classic, known as the East-West Game. Introduced in Chicago in 1933, this annual event later drew as many as 50,000 fans to see superstars such as Satchel Paige. Paige was the most recognized black ball player for two decades. Some still say he's the best pitcher the sport ever saw. What made him so great, he could throw hard, but he had control. We'd go down to the bullpen each night and uh, he wouldn't warm up with the plate. He'd get a piece of chewing gum, a chewing gum wrapper, and he would set that down there and then he would warm up on that and he could just right on the corners or right down the middle of that uh, uh, chewing gum wrapper. He, he was one of the greatest pitchers that I've ever uh, witnessed taking the mound. The greatest hitter in Negro baseball was Josh Gibson. He had the power of Babe Ruth and could hit 70 home runs a season, but died before making it to the big leagues. There's no doubt that the Negro Leagues had some of the best players of any color in baseball history. As time progressed, more blacks and whites began to question why baseball was segregated. Thousands of black soldiers were dying for our country in World War II, and yet they could not play baseball in the major leagues. Finally, Senator Albert Happy Chandler, the new commissioner of baseball, bowed to intense pressure and overturned the owner's vote to continue excluding black players from the national game. In 1942, Branch Rickey became the general manager for the Dodgers. Now his goal was to find the right man to help break the color barrier. Jackie Robinson was that man. Robinson may not have been the best ball player in America, but he had maturity on his side. Robinson was 28, married, intelligent, and had been an all-American football player in college. He'd served in the military. He was tough, and he needed to be. He was entering a very stressful and successful new life. Robinson signed with the Dodgers organization in 1945. His first year in the majors was so outstanding that he was named Rookie of the Year. Black baseball changed forever when Robinson brought down the color barrier. The best players like Roy Campanella, Willie Mays, Ernie Banks, and Hank Aaron could now go on to the major leagues, and black fans followed. Once great Negro teams started folding in the late 40s, and by 1955, most were only memories. The Negro American League officially closed its doors in 1960. You could say that the Negro Leagues were so successful that they put themselves out of business. Playing in the major leagues was what all black players had dreamed of. Finally, they could prove that they were stars on any field. And I guarantee you right now, that if the ball club that I played on in 1954 was in the major league today, they would finish in the first division or probably win the first division and then go on to win the World Series. The Negro Baseball Leagues, they helped integrate America with their love of the all-American game. Well, my dreams was just playing ball, that's all. Yeah, I just enjoyed playing baseball. 